to Chow Talks 2021! Yeah. Today, we are coming to you live from the RDS in Dublin. Chow Talks was created by the Ombudsman for Children's Office to celebrate World Children's Day, which is tomorrow. Chow Talks is all about creating a space where young people can share their stories, their experiences, and most importantly, their messages about the issues they're most passionate about today. Back in August, the Ombudsman for Children's Office put out the call inviting young people to submit their ideas for speeches. Seven stories went on to be chosen, and for the past three months, those young people have been working closely with the Ombudsman for Children's Office on today's talks. The theme for this year's event is My Hopes for the Future. Today, you're going to hear very inspiring talks from everything from climate change to women in farming. Mental health to fast fashion the importance of patients to hospital waiting lists, and the importance of empowering young people. We are absolutely delighted to be joined by some very special guests, including a special video put together for, by the students from Sandy Mount Educate Together, sharing their own hopes for the future, which are here in the audience today. So give yourselves a little round of applause. <laughs> We will also have a special performance from Music Generation to close off the show, and we're overjoyed to be joined by you, our audience. We are so excited that you could be joined with us in person. So again, give yourselves a big round of applause. My name is Oshin Putt. And I'm Catherine Amasan. Both myself and Catherine have been lucky enough to give our own child talks over the last few years, so we both know how excited our speakers are feeling right now backstage. Before we meet them, we're going to play a short video from the Minister for Children, Disability, Equality, Integration and Youth, who couldn't be with us today. Here is Minister Roderick O'Gorman. Children and young people's right to be heard is something that we take very seriously and in my department we work very hard to ensure that your voices are heard and have influence in decision making processes that have an impact on your lives. This year my department launched the National Participation Framework for Children and Young People's Participation in Decision Making. The framework sets out a clear pathway on how adult decision makers can meet their obligations under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child to ensure children and young people's views are included in important decisions. Over the last two years, the participation team in my department has heard the voices of young people on everything from climate action to family law, the impact of COVID on young people, teacher learning and many more issues. Something that has come back strongly to us from young people is that they are deeply engaged in social justice and equality work. Equality and equal treatment for girls and boys, women and men is a goal that is very important to me and to my colleagues in government. When the National Strategy for Women and Girls finishes at the end of this year, we've promised to put in place a new strategy with new actions and new ideas on how to build a society with full gender equality. Earlier this year, the Citizens' Assembly on Gender Equality made 45 valuable recommendations which the government will now consider and respond to. The Citizens' Assembly on Gender Equality, as with other Citizens' Assemblies, is an example of government listening to everyone in our society. Today, we will be listening with interest to what matters to you as young people and what a world with gender equality would look like to you and how we can actually get there. Young people have also often raised with me direct provision and the need to do better for people who come here seeking asylum. For children who are living in direct provision, I listen to your voices and I hear you. Even though I know many of you enjoy the sense of community, access to friends and play in recreation facilities and homework clubs, many of you are also eager to have your own homes and I'm determined to give you that. To do that, 
I will end the direct provision system and replace it with a new international protection uh, support service. And I'll do that by the end of 2024. You have helped me achieve this. I listen to you, the voices of children in direct provision. Our new funding model focuses on children's human rights. It will respect your rights, the rights of children. It will provide child-friendly services, including vulnerability assessments, with your needs in mind. The new model will fight against isolation and help you integrate into your new communities by encouraging English language classes, helping you in school, and giving, you, giving your family the opportunity of your own front door. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you today in person, but I want to emphasize my commitment to continue listening to you. Thanks very much. Now, right about now, our speakers are assembled backstage, eagerly waiting, eagerly waiting their turn to come out here and share their own talk inspired by the theme, My Hopes for the Future. And we are very well aware of how nerve-wracking it can be to come up on stage and deliver a talk in front of a really big audience. And for a lot of our speakers, this is their very first time being able to speak publicly like this. And we have no doubt that you'll all give them a huge round of applause. And remember, the louder, the better. Our, our, excuse me. our first speaker of Child Talks 2021 is a sixth year from Wicklow. Uh, and with her talk, is asking us to think more about the clothes we wear. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Angelica. Hey, I'm Angelica. I'm in sixth year at the moment, but this story, the one I want to tell all of you, starts a lot earlier. When I started school, we all wore the same uniform. The only way to express yourself was the runners you'd wear for PE. The one thing we could express ourselves through, yet we all wore similar ones, with stripes and ticks in a rainbow of different colours and price tags. At that age, you just want to be like everyone else, even if it's just wearing the same runners. That's kind of how fast fashion comes into it. And I'll be honest, it's something I've only really found out about now. See. I was in TY, a global studies class, and my teacher said, right class, I'm putting on a documentary. Great, I thought to myself, a nice easy end to the day. I can just sit back and have the crack with my mates. Except that's not what happened. See, the documentary was about fast fashion. Now, I knew a little bit about it before. You know, there was a shop or two I tried to avoid because the garment workers that made the clothes halfway across the world were exploited and paid in pennies. What I didn't expect, though, was the impact that documentary would have on me. It showed me what life was like for those workers and the huge environmental cause that fast fashion causes. I went home and I took a look at my wardrobe and I felt sick to my stomach. You see, it wasn't just a few shops I knew to avoid. It was huge global companies, shops I'd been in, shops I'd bought clothes from, and shops that influencers and celebrities had told me to buy from. All along, I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was avoiding fast fashion, but I was just doing the opposite. I knew about huge global issues like climate change. I even volunteered in the seal rescue centre down the road. Yet, I was living under a rock because I didn't know about the huge global damage that my wardrobe caused. I went back into class the next day, and everyone had forgotten about it. And I did too, because the pandemic happened. During the pandemic, all of the shops were closed. And the only way to buy clothes was online. Fast fashion absolutely thrives online. You know, influencers and regular teenagers alike were buying huge hauls of really cheap clothes. And I know this because I did too. Except when the clothes came in the mail a few weeks later, I felt really, really guilty about it. And I knew I shouldn't feel guilty for the clothes I'm buying. I realized that while I was buying huge amounts of clothes, I didn't actually like them. They were just trendy, and I was only buying them because people my age did and celebrities told me to. I realized that if I wanted to feel not guilty about the clothes and feel better about myself, that I'd just have to start buying less and buying things that I liked. Now, I'll be honest, it wasn't easy. You know, old habits do die hard. 
So I deleted all the fast fashion apps from my phone and I unsubscribed from the constant emails telling me of a 50% off sale for two hours only. And I started browsing in vintage stores and charity shops. And I found not only it was better for my conscience, but it was better for my wallet and the environment. This World Children's Day, there will be children all across the world exploited in sweatshops so that we can have cheap clothes. So to everyone listening today, whether you're a social media influencer or even just someone being influenced, please remember, it's never too late to do better or be more sustainable when it comes to fashion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelica, for kickstarting Child Talks 2021 with something so thought provoking. Our next speaker is only 12 years of age and has come all the way from Kilkenny to be with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Dara? <laughs> My name is Dara, I am 12. I am at my happiest when I'm watching soccer with my dad and my two brothers. My favourite team is Chelsea. I play midfield for Stonyford. I love practising football with my brothers, but sometimes I'm not able to play. One day that sticks out in my mind was when my two brothers were playing football in our back garden. That day I couldn't play. I was in too much pain. In fact, the pain was so bad I had to lie sitting on the ground as it was the most comfortable place. I live with scoliosis. I was diagnosed at age two and I have an S-shaped spine. Scoliosis makes everything you do harder. It makes eating harder. I fell full after two bites. My stomach was squashed and I couldn't gain weight. It makes running harder. I used to feel breathless after playing soccer and I felt like I couldn't keep up with my friends. Uh, it makes family days out harder. I was so tired after a day out, I would, I would, I would have bad pain, in my, I would have bad leg pain afterwards. The only thing that would help, <clears throat> the only thing that would make me feel better was surgery. I was placed on a waiting list for surgery when I was just six years old. We were told it would take, it would, I would have to wait six months for surgery, but instead I waited for 15 months. Surgery is scary, but waiting for surgery is just as bad. I knew I needed the surgery. Let's do it, I said. After my surgery, my life changed. <clears throat> I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I could now eat more than two bites without feeling full, and I gained weight. I could now enjoy food. I could run without huffing and puffing. One of the best days I've had since my surgery was being able to visit Chelsea FC. I barely slept a wink the night before. Dad had arranged for a special tour, and even my lights, and even my name was up in the lights. I realised just how far I'd come. Life was good. Today I'm now once again on a wink list for scoliosis surgery. My lungs and heart need more space, so that means I need more surgery. My surgeon says this will happen in January, but we can only hope it will. Access to scoliosis surgery is life-changing. One day I hope to travel the world, play sport and enjoy life. So my message is to the HSC, the government and the people who are in charge, cut the waiting list and let me reach my potential. Thanks, Dara, for your speech, which has such an important message for the politicians out there. On behalf of everyone here, we're wishing you the best of luck with your next surgery. Our next speaker is a 17-year-old from Galway who's here to talk about being a farmer in a male-dominated world. Please welcome to the stage, Ella. Hello. My name is Ella O'Donoghue Cannon. I'm 17 from a little town called Amore in County Galway. I've known since I was knee high to a grasshopper that I always wanted to be a farmer. For me though, farming is not a gender thing. I, um, for me though, farming is not a gender thing. I drive a tractor, no ordinary machine. Um, one of the proudest moments in my life so far was when I, drove the tractor on the N17. It was the proudest day of my life. Because after this experience, um, 
I was. Um, um, because after the experience, I was buzzing. Because me, a 16-year-old girl at the time, drove a powerful machine by herself on the N17. After this, I was tractor mad. I was a monster. <laughs> I was now confident and comfortable driving the tractor. One day, my father asked me to go to the petrol station to get diesel, which is normal. I was driving up. Everything was OK. The music was blaring until I pulled into the petrol station, and then it all changed. I pulled into the petrol station, and this, and this day, there was a semi-final happening, and s about seven carloads of lads were there, because this is a petrol station that all the lads my age get their petrol from. So all eyes were on me. I didn't care, because they're just boys, and I don't care. Um, so then there were even more wow when I went up to the thing and then I got the diesel. So I clocked up 100 euro and I went into the petrol station to pay and there was a young lad behind the counter. So I say, I have 100 euro diesel, can I pay for it please? He was like, do you realise it's white diesel that goes into car? And I pointed up to the camera that's there when you pay for diesel and I said, green thing, big tractor, that's mine. I'll pay for the diesel, thanks Owen. After I came out of this, after I came out of the petrol station, I felt so angry. I felt so patronised because if I was male, there was no questions to be asked. I went home. About, I went home and I decided that maybe tractor was not for me after all. So I decided to just do the groundwork. About two months pass, and I've seen multiple TikToks of young female farmers driving tractors with not a bother in the world to them. So I think maybe someday in the far, far future I'll be able to do this. But my confidence isn't quite there yet. So about another month later, the dreaded question gets asked again. Will you go into town for diesel? I have another absolute meltdown. But then my mother pulls me into the hut, because we have a hut on our farm, and she says... It's not what's in front of you that's the problem, it's what's in your head. So I stop and I think for a minute, what is actually stopping me? It's just words. So then I get into the tractor and I go do the exact same run and the exact same things happened. But you want to know what was different? I ignored them, I let them off, they're just boys. And I'm an independent woman doing my, my own thing. And now I'm much more confident and I can drive the tractor anywhere and everywhere I want. Can you believe that only two weeks ago, there was 387 tractors, trucks, and vintage cars in a tractor run I went to? And out of all of them, I was the only female driving independently. Crazy, I know. My hopes and dreams for the future is that I want to be the first female from my hometown to go do the harvest in England. I also want to become an agricultural lecturer. Out of the 70,000 women, that farm, only 12% of them are recognised by the Department of Agriculture? This is crazy. Thanks for listening. I remember. Oh, yeah. um, my message to everyone, especially girls, is that do what makes you happy and not what makes you liked. Thanks for listening. I remember, farming is about love and a way of life. Wow, that was such an amazing and brilliant talk with a really powerful message. I, I love it, I'm obsessed. We are already three stories into Child Talks 2021, and as you've been hearing, the theme for this event is my hopes for the future. We are now going to watch a short video from brother and sister, Molly who's 12 and Bobby who's 10, with their talk inspired by their time growing up in Galway and their struggle to get more freedom to do the things that they want to do. Let's hear what they have to say. Hi, I'm Molly. And I am Bobby. We are in six and four class, Educate Together National School. One of our most treasured places to visit is a beautiful park near our house called Dangan. One of our favorite things to do is play tag on our bikes and scooters. 
We love going to Dunkin' on our bikes, but our parents think that the roads closer there are too dangerous with all the cars. The only way we're allowed to go there is if we're taken there by our parents. Being supervised like this is embarrassing and it's unfair, but it's not just our parents who worry too much about us. Last year I was not able to march in the Friday for Future climate change events because our school was beside a dangerous road. I was disappointed that I could not participate in a global event set up by young people for young people. We're not allowed to cycle or walk to the schools or the shops either. We don't really want to be able to cycle to show our parents and ourselves that we can do it. And one day, our wish came true. One day, Dad, both our bikes could not fit in the car. Dad said I could cycle home on my own. I was excited and scared, but I made it home safe, and I was super proud and happy of myself. That day, I saw the world in a new light. Even though I was a kid, I could do what any adult could do, because I'm a human being, and I share the same freedom and rights, just like everyone else. When I saw that Molly could do it, I wanted to try for myself. It took a little nudging, but Dad finally agreed. It didn't go all perfectly the first time, because I actually got lost on my first attempt. After a while, I grew more confident and Dad let me go out again. I felt proud and confident with myself. Over the next few weeks, we got more and more freedom. Although there was a period of time where Dad wouldn't let us leave the house without walkie-talkies. He was monitoring our movements from headquarters and demanded that we say Roger that and over and out. Thankfully, that period didn't last too long. And now we're able to go out to Dangit and have fun and enjoy times with friends. Cycling and walking is so important for young people, giving young people their independence at a young age empowers us to participate in our communities. If you are worried about the safety of the road, don't take it out on us. We're the ones who suffer the most. Instead, work with your children. Teach them the rules of the road. And if you're still worried, campaign for a bicycle lane or a traffic light to be installed. Work with us and believe in us. There are streets too. Thank you, Molly and Bobby, there with a simple but powerful message to all parents out there. Now we're going to, now we're going to ask the Ombudsman for Children, Dr. Niall Muldoon, to join us on stage and share with us a story about an experience that shaped his own hopes for the future as Ombudsman for Children. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Dr. Niall Muldoon. Thank you very much, Oshin. Um, as Ombudsman for Children, I'm really honoured and humbled to be chosen as such and to be in my second term. But it's not an easy job and I just want to bring you back to maybe the, the first year I was in, involved. When I came in, there's no, there's no induction, there's no uh, playbook, there's no three months probation. You have to hit the ground running. Very first week, all I wanted to do, my target for, for my job as, as Ombudsman for Children was always to make sure I put children at the centre of everything I did. The very first week I was said, right, we're going to have to do an interview. There's lots of uh, major media wanted to speak to me, find out what my plans were, what my priorities were. So I said, give me 10 days. And we worked very, very hard because there's so many issues going on. There's 1.2 million children. There's a million children in education. There's children in, uh, with mental health issues, children with disabilities, children who are homeless, children with uh, special education needs. A whole lot of issues around children's rights that I had to learn about. So three of us worked very, very hard for those 10 days and three of us worked solid for three days to look at all the issues that I might be asked in the interview, all the questions, all the difficult things, to say how I would dress, how I would speak. Real sense of pressure, a lot of stuff to bring together. We concentrated on 25 issues, huge amount of work done. I did three interviews that day and they went fairly well, except for the one issue that we hadn't covered. And there's always one, and I winged it. And it didn't go so well. The very next day, that's what the headlines were with the issue that I hadn't covered well. And it really knocked me for six and damaged my confidence. And I said, how am I going to do this? I feel I've let down the office. It took about six weeks to get that uh, corrected and to get our message out properly afterwards. So what I did then was I threw myself into the books. I studied everything. I learned, how to do, learned everything that was going on. I read everything I possibly could. I even hired somebody to help me with uh, increasing my, improving my memory and, my, and speed reading. I did all of that, I really threw myself into the books, and we did a lot of good work over that year. But it came at a cost. By the time we got to January the following year, which is about nine, ten months later, a lot of work going on. We were fighting with governments around things like, because we still had children in adult prisons, we still had children in direct provision who weren't able to access our office, 
and we had lots of other issues coming up. We were due to go to the Geneva to speak to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. I had a big uh, interview coming up. And in the middle of January, I got a phone call. I was working, my head was in the books. I was studying away, researching, reading, doing all the stuff I had to do, getting ready for these things. And I got a phone call from my staff downstairs. Now, we bring children into our office. When the office is open for, for public, we had 1,000 children a year would come through and do child workshops, child rights workshops, learn about their rights. And I got a phone call one afternoon from my staff saying, there's a, there's a group of children down here. Do you want to come down and say hello to them? And I said, no, I can't. I have an interview tomorrow. I'm up to my eyes. I'm very, very busy. So I put down the phone. And as soon as I did, this voice in my head just screamed, Niall, you haven't chatted to a child in eight weeks. You haven't been downstairs in eight weeks. There's something wrong here. And I realized that, OK, it takes about 20 minutes to go downstairs and do the stuff. It's not going to make any difference. So I went downstairs. And as I was coming downstairs, I knew there was a group of children. The children were about 8 to 12 years of age. There was only about 12 of them. But when I came around the corner, they were making enough noise for 30 people. They were running around, they were jumping on beanbags, they were laughing and giggling and having fun, and it really cheered me up. And I came around the corner, and as I did, this lovely little blonde girl was sitting at a table, and she saw me, and she just gave me this big wave, because she must have recognized me from the pictures in the, in the workshop, the picture of me and President Higgins. And we went in, and the parents, or the, the teachers and the SNAs would have gathered the, the children together. It was like herding cats to try and bring them to sit at the table and ask me a few questions. They eventually did, they got them there, and it allowed, they, they asked some great questions. It was like prime time, really investigative journalism. You know, like, um, what car do you drive? You know, uh, does your, is your driver your bodyguard? Uh, how much do you earn? What's it like having paparazzi outside your house every day? So I thought, I, I, they must have thought I was Ryan Reynolds or someone. You know, really, they, I think they really thought it was super important. But it was great fun, and we had great crack, and then it finished. And usually then I go and meet the, the staff and the youth workers and the teachers, whoever was there at the time. But I was standing against a wall, and before I got a chance to do this, I could see little Emily in the corner tearing a piece of paper off her jotter and coming over towards me with her pen. And she looked up at me and she says, would you sign my, an autograph? And I laughed. I said, do you really want me to sign an autograph? She said, yeah, you're famous. You know President Higgins, and you're the ombudsman. You look after children. So I just laughed. I said, OK, no problem at all. So I started writing. And as I did, I could see the four or five other kids tearing bits of paper and coming over. And it was really, they started gathering around me. And as I handed back her, the autograph to Emily, she just spontaneously, out of the blue, just grabbed me, gave me a big hug. And she was only up to my waist. It was just lovely, and it was a, a chain reaction. The other four or five who were waiting for the autograph, they grabbed me and gave me a big hug as well. And again, like children do, the chain reaction, the other four or five who weren't interested in the autograph came over for the hug. And I, like a real well-qualified, 25 years as a, as a psychologist and one year as an ombudsman, I did exactly what I should have done. Put my hands on the head up here and said, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. And I looked at the staff to prove that I wasn't doing anything wrong, and they were laughing at me. So I just said, okay, that's, I'm only being silly here. And I put my arms around them. And for 20 seconds, we had the most fabulous, unconditional love group hug. And it really changed my life because it, it reminded me of why I'm doing this job. It reminded me that the children want our time. They want us to be, they want to be the center of our attention. They reminded me why I was in this job and why I was trying to do the work I was trying to do. And Emily wanted to tell us that they liked us and they were here for us and they liked the fact that we gave them time. They liked the fact that we were there and protecting them. And it just changed everything I did from there on. And it gave me the confidence again to be the ombudsman that I wanted to be, not to be afraid of making mistakes in interviews, not to be afraid of, of the paperwork. It was about the children. We created a new strategic plan. We created a set of values after that that put children back at the center of what we were doing. It's why we set up Child Talks so that children could say what they wanted to say, not what we asked them to talk about, what they wanted to talk about. And for me, I want to do the same. I call that my sparkling moment, and I want to put the challenge out to you, every adult in the audience that is listening and is here. If you're a parent, an aunt, an uncle, a teacher, a GP, a social worker, a civil servant, a minister, are you listening to the children that you're working with? Are you listening to the children you live with and you grow up with? Are you giving them the time when you're there? Are you paying attention and are you doing what they ask of you? And if you can't do it, are you telling them why? That's what keeps me going. That's what reminds me of what I need to do. And that sparkling moment, I hope you all get plenty of them in your lives. I've certainly carried that with me. I want to say thank you very, very much. And I look, hope you enjoy the rest of the Child Talks.
Thank you, Niall, for such a heartfelt message about the importance of putting children and young people first. The Ombudsman for Children's Office is very much a place for young people to voice their concerns, make a complaint, and share their experiences and viewpoints at events like Child Talks. Our next speaker is going to talk about something that we can't escape, the climate crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Darius. <laughs> Hello, my name is Darius, I'm 16 years old and I'm Polish, but I've lived here for basically all my life. Well, let's travel back to May 2021. Life seemed to be brightening again. Schools had just reopened, but I as a teacher faced a dangerous predator. The second the schools reopened, predicted grades were introduced. I taught back to first uh, lockdown in 2020. There's nothing to do except to think. So I thought about climate change. But at this point in my life, I thought about climate change in a very unorganized manner. And like the procrastinating teenager I am, it took me a year before I finally organized it. So I decided that I would do a project on climate change. I remembered videos of dolphins swimming in the clear waters of Venice or monkeys taking over a town in Thailand. I remembered the quieter atmosphere outside my bedroom window. Less cars, less noise, must have meant less pollution. I thought this showed climate action throughout the world, but I was wrong. I found that the climate emergency had actually gotten worse in 2020. The dolphins were actually red herring. I could have left it there, but I chose to get answers. I found that masks worsened the climate emergency through the use of more single-use plastics. I only found this through a conversation with a friend, even though it had been literally staring at me for months. I found that we in Ireland are not vocal enough about climate action from the government, and we accept tiny steps as reasonable. Further, I realized the, that the reason we are not responding to, the, to climate change, like the pandemic, was, that, was our procrastination. The pandemic kills people now. Climate change will kill people in the future. A local grocer shutting down to the pandemic is instantly visible, but him shutting down in 20 years' time makes us wrongly think we have time to respond. The answers left deep scars, but I felt confident I could get my voice out there now. I completed the project and turned it in. Now I could get my voice out there. Never before in my life had I gotten my voice out there. I basically had no, I needed to challenge myself in a way where I could speak my voice, as to make it better, louder and clearer. Surprisingly enough, one of the first things I got involved with was child talks. I guess aiming high was always worth a shot. But then I got involved with Camilla Nogue. Camilla gave me a great opportunity to get my voice out there amongst my peers and to learn from mistakes easier and, get, and make myself more proud of my voice. I'm still trying to find new ways to get my voice out there. But my confidence is growing all the time. Currently, I'm on stage in front of a crowd of people giving a speech and having it broadcast. I don't know what my future exactly entails, but I know that I've gained so much from just being inquisitive. But I do know what your future entails, and you do too. Climate change will bring about lots of things. There's people talking about it already. Instead, I should tell you one thing. We are not vocal enough, and that's the main issue. Politicians have chronic job insecurity. One unpopular action can make them lose an election. If we decide not to support politicians who do not put climate action at the centre of their plans, we will force them to conduct climate action. So, COP26 has resulted in another useless piece of paper. But we can't be discouraged. If we do not put pressure on politicians, the same thing will happen over and over again. Without knowing the story, we can't act on it. 
without knowing the story, we can't be engaged. So find the story of climate change out for yourself, just like I did. We might be reacting late, but climate uh, what, uh, fortune favors the bold. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darius, for those really important words for young people in Ireland today. Our next talk explores the theme of mental health during COVID-19. From Wicklow, will you give a big round of applause to Franny? Hi, my name's Franny. When I was younger, I enjoyed school. In particular, I liked art, or any time I was able to be creative, really. I enjoyed interacting with people, but this all slowly changed in 2019, and I enjoyed school less and less. There was one day in particular where things just got too much for me. I woke up at seven, forgot to have breakfast, and went to catch the bus. When I arrived in school, I was greeted with lights glaring down at me and busy corridors. When the bell finally rang for lunch, I went straight to my locker. But oh no, my lunch had fallen right onto the floor and it was being kicked about like a football. At this moment, I just had enough. I wanted to go, hide in my bed and never come back out. I started to get more and more burnt out. I eventually stopped going to school. My family was concerned, but I just couldn't go. I was worried about my education but I couldn't do anything apart from stay in my room. I stopped doing all my art and my room became messier and messier. Small things like getting up in the morning, having a shower, getting dressed, they were all a very big struggle. And to be honest, a lot of the time, I didn't win. When COVID hit, the last connections I had with the outside world, gone. I'd do an occasional jigsaw with my mum and talk to my cousin on the phone. But that was pretty much it. The thought of leaving the house was mortifying. It was like I was stuck in time and everyone and everything around me was moving on just fine. During lockdown, I spent all my time in my room with all my cats. I love animals and I have quite a few. My boy's name's Stampy. He would always come up and check on me and he was always there when I needed him. We foster cats, and one of them had kittens. They were tiny, cute little things, and I spent a lot of time with them. One day, my mum mentioned that my neighbours were looking for a kitten. Later on that week, I heard them outside, and before I knew it, I was bundling them all up, putting, out them, out, putting them in a basket, and I went straight out the front door. I said hello, and we sat down on the ground and started playing with them. This was the first time in a very long time I interacted with people outside of my family. I became very good friends with my neighbours. We'd hang out, sit in the garden, drink tea, and play with cats, obviously. As time went by, I started feeling better. Those earlier challenges weren't so big anymore. I even started to do a little art again. I was looking for something else to challenge myself with, but I wasn't ready to go back to school. So I started volunteering in my local charity shop. This was really fun and I really enjoyed it. My hopes for the future is to go to university and study environmental science. I've cur currently just started college and it's an agricultural college. So most people there like plants, animals, photography, all the things I like. It's been very daunting at times, but I'm really enjoying it. I've met some really cool people and I've learned to take it one day at a time. My message to you is that yes, people are scary, but being alone is a lot worse. Change is scary and the first step is always gonna be the hardest. But as one good friend once told me, strangers, will be scary. 
But when they're friends, they're not so bad. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Franny, for sharing your thanks, Franny, for sharing your story. It's those little first steps we take that can always lead to such big things. It's hard to believe, but we're approaching the end of the show. Our final storyteller is a, is part of Child Talks 2021. As part of Child Talks 2021, is another short video. This time, shot in Mosney Direct Provision Centres, where our speaker lives with her mum. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for this remarkable story of success during lockdown. Here's Precious. I came to Ireland in 2016 and I was well settled in a community and school. My mom and I have been living in direct provision in Mosni. Life here was kind of challenging during the lockdown. We couldn't visit anyone. My mom works, so sometimes I'll be on my own. But the one thing that helped me was baking. I've always loved baking in school. Whenever my mom and I would go shopping, she'd buy some cookery books and baking books. When I started things out, things never went as planned. I would try all the ingredients in the house and try to bake. Whenever my mom would ask me why the shelves were empty, I would tell her I'm trying to bake. But that's how I learned. Two days before my birthday, I asked my mom to buy all the baking ingredients I needed. I wanted to bake my own birthday cake. Looking back now, the cake wasn't too perfect, but was perfect for me. When friends came over, they tested the cake and absolutely loved it. My birthday cake gave birth to Precious Cake International. I started baking for money and I would set everything on a fair price and everything would be gone within a minute. Recently, I've opened up my own Instagram page at precious.underscorebakes. Sometimes I'd get massive orders and I would not be able to handle them by myself. This has taught me to be self-reliant and not to depend on anybody else. I've recently purchased my own professional mixer and my own phone and other baking equipment. Now we are here today. The theme of Chat Talks 2021 is hopes for my future. I've always wanted to be a doctor, but now I'm focusing on baking and building up my small business. I'm looking at having an international bakery or kitchen where others come to learn, train and upskill from me. Living direct provision has been hard for me, but the most valuable thing I've learned is patience. Sometimes everything does not go as planned. A cake might come out burnt, a cake might come out wrong, but I just have to start all over again. Just like in life, sometimes we end up losing hope, but in every successful business, patience is needed to help you succeed. I always say trust the process. Even if you cannot see light in the tunnel, if you keep on going at the end of the tunnel, light must truly come, so keep on going. Thank you so much, Precious, for sharing your story with us. And if you haven't seen Precious's baking before, be sure to check her out on Instagram. That's at precious.underscorebakes. Her cakes are absolutely incredible. I am personally obsessed. <laughs> the theme of Child Talks 2021 is, of course, my hopes for the future. We, we've just heard from our speakers what their hopes are for the future, but we decided to also put the same question to the students of Sandy Mount Educate Together, our audience tonight. Let's take a look at what they have to say. Today. My hopes for the future are that women will finally be treated as equals of men. That means equal pay, equal job opportunities, and equal status under the law. I hope that little girls will have equal opportunities to boys and that everyone can achieve their hopes and dreams regardless of their gender. I hope that the world puts in more effort and faith in scientific thinking over religious thinking. I want to live in a houseboat with cats and my partner. And my hopes for the future are that the world becomes a kinder place, a more accepting place, 
and that we finally take enough action to resolve climate change related issues and climate change as a whole. I hope to be happy and successful in the future. I want to make an impact on the world. I want to be able to do all the things I've always dreamed of. I want to be able to go see swimming in a non-polluted ocean and travel the world and to have children and not worry about them growing up in a polluted world. I wish to have two options. Either pursue academia in history, linguistics, or science, or alternatively become T shock. Um, my hopes for the future. A huge hope I have for the future is to work in fact to better differences with autism or other general disorders. My goal significantly is to achieve overall better inclusivity of kindness and compassion with all individuals accepting each other respectfully and open minded to their differences. Thank you so much to the students of Sandyford Educate Together for helping us put together that video. That was so great. Well done. Incredible, folks. That brings us to the close of Child Talks 2021. You've, today you've heard stories from an amazing group of young people who have spent the last few months working with the OCO to develop today's stories into something really, really special. Can we have one more big round? Wait, before you applause, let me say the names. Uh, we have Angelica, Dara, Ella, Darius, and Franny. Big round of applause for them. And again, another huge round of applause to Molly and Bobby and Precious for their brilliant video stories. And this brings Child Talks 2021 to a close, but we'll be back next year with the Child Talks 2022. If you've been inspired by the young people on stage and you've got something important to say, make sure to keep an eye out on our website for updates about how to get involved. You've been watching Child Talks 2021, coming to you live from RDS. My name is Oshin Putt. And I'm Catherine Amasan. And to play us out and bring Child Talks 2021 to a close, we are delighted to be joined again by Music Generation, an organization that works with children to give them opportunities to create, play, and perform their own music in their own communities. And this track that they are about to present for us was specially written for today. So it's really, really special and we are so grateful. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Adam, Taylor, Lydia, Alicia, Ethan, Nick, and Sean, and their mentors from Music Generation with their song, Noise Music. <laughs> Hello. Child Talks. Run it, yeah. Do, do, check the mic. Uh, yo, it's the old mess with the boy. Face is kind of hit. Don't the mic, cause I'm crazy with the syllables. Slice it through your airways, cause I'm so hospitable. Got the cat on board, cause I'm so hospitable. Everywhere that I go, yeah, I moonwalk So I'm always burning fresh holes in my new socks Uh, yeah, right on the hill Eating bananas and slipping on the pill What's up? Flip flopping on the beat, but I'm killing it It's seven dick, cause my people really feeling it I rock and I ride, I can seal it in Dropping fucking fresh tracks like I be dealing in I wake up, but I spit out some flip Your best friends are rapping, yo, I'm better than them, uh I do it, not for the bread. When I kick it, even the 95 ahead, what's up? Pulls, pulls to the temper. Unpredictable like snow in the desert. Best believe I'm excelling at this endeavor in a chosen form of vocal expression. All for one with this music. All kinds of noise when we do it. All for one how we move and it takes all kinds to make this noise music.
want to bring love to the peace that was gonna get tight. I've been rapping about it since I was a baby. Writing raps all day, and I am now I'm like Jimmy. I'm a cold blooded man with no name and no game. I'm a big fat hungry beast that hasn't been tamed. I got nine lives, but don't call me cackers. I'm crazy, I gotta spit these rhymes. I like I'm rapping, rapping Jay Z. Unpredictable like snow in the desert Best believe we're excelling in this endeavor In our chosen form of vocal expression All for one with this music All kinds of noise when we do it All for one how I'm moving It takes all kinds to make this noise music All for one how I'm moving It takes all kinds to make this noise music All for one how I'm moving It takes all kinds to make this noise music